Hey guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Satanic Panic video. And this time I'd like to present this. Dungeons and Dragons Adventure or Abomination. Now this is part of a one of a series, God's Plan for You, from CBN. Now I wasn't really aware of this. Um, CBN is the Christian Broadcasting Network, which was founded by Pat Robertson. Now Pat Robertson's a name I do recognise, because he's spoken out against Dungeons and Dragons quite a lot, for a long time. And basically he still does the same thing. It's quite remarkable when you see him speaking in 2017 and things. People will phone into his show saying, my boyfriend is addicted to gaming and I think it's a bad influence. And he'll go, oh, Dungeons and Dragons is a terrible game. When they're really talking about video games. <laughs> he learnt one thing about games and that's Dungeons and Dragons is a game. It's got some satanic elements in it, so it's a bad thing. And basically that's done him for the past 40 years. Anyway, this leaflet came out in 1992, which totally surprises me, because to me, the 90s is still quite modern. I know there's young members, I've got my nieces and nephews who watch these videos, who will look at that as terribly, terribly old. But the 90s to me seemed the start of the modern era. I was born in the 70s, I see the 70s as very beige and olden times. The 80s was kind of exciting because we were starting to get into computers and things. But the 90s, I was on the internet in the 90s. I was going out to parties, going to conventions and all that. Things I still do to this day. And it seems the start of the modern age. The idea that a leaflet was coming out going, Dungeons and Dragons is the work of the devil in the 90s seems really, really out of time. Now, the leaflet is written by here, Richard White. Now, I can't find any reference to Richard White apart from this leaflet, and it is referenced in a number of places. Um, there's a book uh, I've downloaded to read through about the Satanic Panic from the Christian side of things. Um, Demon's Game or something, The Devil's Game. But that book references Richard White writing in this leaflet, but I can't find anything else. Um, I would have expected him probably to write for the Christian Broadcasting Network, but I can't find anything. So, I don't know whether he's a specialist in Dungeons and Dragons, that they hired him for this, or whatever. There's just no information I can really find about him. Now, I've done some research, and we'll delve into that. Um, some elements where it mentions, I won't go too deep into, because... There's later videos, there's leaflets and things that I'll cover, which delve into it in far more detail. Um, things about Patricia Pulling, for example. I've got the leaflet from Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons to do in a future one of these videos. And focusing on Patricia Pulling and her story should probably be part of that video rather than this. But I'll go over it briefly. Anyway, Adventure or Abomination, Creativity or Cruelty, Diversion or Demonology, Dungeons and Dragons, the fancy role-playing game. Well, he's loving his alliteration. Dungeons and Dragons, let's go for it. I'm very disappointed he never carried it on further. Continues to generate controversy while attempting to retain its dominance of the market for such games. Sold since 1974 by TSR Incorporated of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, Dungeons and Dragons also continues to fill the coffers. The latest annual income for this product tops 18 million, with an estimated 4 million players in the US, says Dieter Sto Sturm. Director of Corporate Relations for TSR. The financial power of the game drew from an initial $2,000 investment to sales of $4 million in 1979. Called Dungeons and Dollars by the press, the game became the champion fad on college campuses. Well, I don't know who was referring to it as Dungeons and Dollars, because $4 million turnover is decent, but it doesn't seem ridiculously high. Um, scrutiny and soaring sales. Controversy simmered during the early years of the game's history, then boiled over after James D. Egbert, an ardent D&D player, disappeared from the Michigan State University campus on August 15, 1979. The 16-year-old computer was, was found a month later. Although his disappearance was said to be unrelated to his obsession with D&D, Egbert's suicide one year later provoked national media scrutiny of the game. Well, the story is quite a famous one. Um, it was investigated by a guy called William Deere who turned around and said it was nothing to do with Dungeons & Dragons, and then sold a book, I think it's called The Dungeon Master, I've got a copy somewhere, I think, over there. Um, I bought it years ago, where he explored Dungeons & Dragons and what he thought of it. 
But he was really playing up because he knew he could get an audience out of it, he could get sales. But the story itself is completely unrelated. As it says, much of the information in that paragraph I just read out, he was a 16-year-old who went off to university. That's a lot of pressure for somebody at 16. You know, my son Adam, who's appeared in some of the videos, turned 18 two days ago. And he would struggle, I think, at university, probably because I've coddled him a bit, I'll admit. I'm uh, that kind of parent. But at 16, to be by yourself at university... I think that's a terrible stress to put a kid under. And the other piece of information that doesn't give is that James Dallas Egbert III, I think his full name was, was gay in the 1980s when it wasn't really accepted. So he was under immense stress at college, university, and he ran away and was staying with somebody else. Now, he was found a few months later and the story kind of came out that it was nothing to do with role-playing. He hadn't actually played that much recently. And for the next year, he didn't play up at all, as far as I can tell from what I've read up on. And then he committed suicide. Because of the stress of being at university young, because of the stress of the media looking at his disappearance, all of this, it's a terrible, terribly sad story. But, again, as I said in previous ones, really nothing to do with Dungeons & Dragons. It's a sad case of the stress that coming out kind of puts on, uh, teenagers under. And the sad story that so many young gay individuals end up killing themselves. Um, I'm afraid he seems to be a victim of that, not of any satanic game. Anyway... This exposure proved to be a windfall for TSR. Sales more than doubled to 8.9 million in 1980. Well, no publicity is good. <laughs> um, yeah, no publicity is good publicity. That saying? I can't remember. Anyway, the publicity worked out well for them. People knew the name. People tried it out. It went to sales. Um, the quest for treasure, often the object of the game itself, was intensified by the manufacturers when they began advertising in the school library journal and hired Dr. Joyce Brothers to tout the benefits of the game to school administrators in an 18-city tour of the United States. Oh no, Corporation tried to sell its product. After capturing the college-age market, TSR targeted the 10- to 18-year-old group by offering discounts to schools, by creating a D&D cartoon shown as part of the CBS Saturday morning lineup, and by licensing Mattel to create computer programs from the game. Uh, I think that kind of works the other way. The way that insinuates is that TSR approached Mattel to go, here's a license, write video games. But from my knowledge, it usually works the other way around, that a games company will approach and ask or try and buy a license. I know that in the 80s and 90s, lots of video game companies did that. I remember Ocean Software sending their guys off to various um, media events, and that's how Ocean got the license for things like Robocop, because nobody had seen the film. It hadn't even come out. They were just buying up licenses to do video game conversions, which is why there were so many dodgy video games conversions in that period, because they would just release anything because they got the license to it. Um... So it seems kind of backwards to me. Charge of the game inspired a cult-related violence in the macabre trail of suicides and murders convinced CBS to take cartoon off the air after three years. Again, I don't know the truth of that. I kind of imagine it just didn't get the ratings. There were a lot of cartoons around about then. You've got your He-Man, you've got your Thundercats, you've got all those. And Dungeons & Dragons never struck me as one which was performing terribly, terribly well. Um, I liked it. I've got the DVDs somewhere downstairs. I've watched it a lot. I've imposed it onto my kids, but I admit it's not the best of the cartoons. It was a very fun one. Um, intense lobbying by anti-D&D critics proved effective when Mattel discontinued their successful D&D computer program games. Well, they brought out three games and then their console kind of died off and they didn't do any more. Um, it doesn't seem like intensive lobbying, unless the intensive lobbying led to people not buying um, Mattel in television consoles. <laughs> um, 
Now, after 12 years, D&D and events, Dungeons and Dragons, AD&D, with the many rule books, prepackaged games called campaigns, and monthly magazines, have been translated into six languages and marketed in 15 countries, Sturm says. What is D&D? The answer depends on who you talk with. Swords and Sorcery best describes what this game is about, for those are two keen fantasy ingredients. Wrote Gygax in the introduction to the official Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook. The 126 book page book sells for $13.95. That reads like advertising script to me. It reads as if they're trying to sell you it. Advanced Dungeons & Dragons is a world, it reads. A fantasy role-playing game that's an exercise in imagination and personal creativity. The game lets all your fantasies come true. This is a world where monsters, dragons, good and evil high priests, fierce demons, and even the gods themselves may enter your character's life. Well, that's the advertising script. It sounds fair. I find it focuses a bit on gods. I don't remember Dungeons & Dragons really focusing that. They're an element in the game. If you're playing a cleric or a paladin, then they'll have their uh, god that they'll follow. But is it that massive an element? And um, Winston Matthews, a lawyer practicing in Haynes, VA, Virginia? I'm afraid I don't know the two-letter codes for American states. VA, wherever that is. Ran unsuccessfully for the Republican nomination for state attorney. General in 1985 on a platform opposing the use of D&D in public schools. So he ran and failed. Oh dear. I don't think that makes him an expert. If he'd won, that would make him more expert. <laughs> the essence of D&D is violence, he says. It teaches Satan worship, spellcasting, witchcraft, murder, rape, suicide, and assassination along the way. Yeah, sure. TSR Sturm says D&D is a healthy exercise for players' imagination and skills. Using skills such as problem-solving, reading, mathematics, imagination, and cooperation among players. You play against the game, not against other players. It's entertainment, it's make-believe, it's recreation, says Sturm. Which I think is a good way of putting it. I have to admit that Dungeons & Dragons really helped my math. When I was younger, I was really, really bad at math. Um, I remember a teacher, when I was particularly young, trying to humiliate me into being better at math by taking me into the year below and getting them to answer a math problem I had failed at. But adding up dice and needing to do it quickly at a game table and making calculations when you've got different systems helped me with numbers. It helped me with math. I'm pretty good at it now. I'm a computer programmer. Okay, I work with a big calculator all the time, but I have a really quite a decent understanding of math now. I um, had to pass modules in it at university from somebody who was getting humiliated when he was younger about it. And I put that all down to playing role-playing games. Having to do math on the fly, add things up, handle numbers in your head, definitely was what taught me to be better at it. Um, not to mention writing skills, um, interactive skills as I speak to people. All of these have definitely been boosted through gaming, in my opinion. Um, influence debated. While Ga Gally Sanchez, a former game designer for TSR, acknowledged in a March 700 Club television interview that D&D is heavily a cult, he denied any evil influence. I want to stress that the game is a good game, said Sanchez. I don't see anything that will convert people to the occult. I didn't see any occultists, any Satanists. The people I worked with were understanding people, good people, and including a minister. Well, I kind of have to back that up. Because, as I've mentioned, we actually had a bishop who played at our game table. He's no longer a bishop, but he still plays at our game table. Um, but, you know, religion doesn't really pay any element to it. I'd also like to mention Gally Sanchez. This was somebody I wasn't aware of. I wanted to know more about them because they mentioned them again later in this uh, pamphlet. But th what he says is kind of negative, and I wanted to get a tone on who was working for TSR which had these beliefs. Now, looking at Gally Sanchez, unfortunately he passed away on September 16th, 2018, of prostate cancer, which he'd been battling for 19 years. So, kind of a sad start to the story. But the story of Galley's life is quite incredible. Um, throughout his adult life, Galley saw himself as a teacher who lived in adventure. As a Latin percussionist, he toured as a member of the band Santana, also performed with Steve Winwood, Stevie Wonder, Dave Matthews Band, and other nationally renowned music groups. For three years, he worked at TSR as a game designer for Dungeons & Dragons. He served as a bilingual counsellor for the Chicano communities in the Midwest. 
Galley was a member of the United Farm, Workers, Farm Workers Organizing Committee, working directly with civil rights icon Cesar Chavez. For a year, he served as a cultural consultant for the Baltimore Orioles. Galley was involved with advertising agencies as a soccer expert and played friendly soccer with legendary Pele. For the last 18 years, he lived in Front Royal. And also amongst that, he wrote for other games. He didn't just work for TSR. He wrote quite heavily for the game Chill, which is a bit of a horror game, and wrote Adventures for a Supplement based on Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. So this doesn't sound like a guy who is heavily into the occult is dangerous. I think he's more saying that you can play games with the occult and it's not going to affect your life. They're trying to put a dark spin on what he said. But I do not see from what he said at that point and how he lived his life that this was anybody who was going to be extremely judgmental about getting involved in the occult for a game. Anyway, we'll come back to uh, Gali Sanchez later because they do make some other comments and I'll put my spin on them. But I'll give you all the information I can and you can make your own decisions about it. Uh, Rosemary Lea Kano, mother of a player who committed suicide, says D&D seduces its players into Satanism. All fantasy role-playing games patterned after the biggest seller Dungeons & Dragons are cleverly written and specifically designed to introduce children to occult research, she says. Once children get involved with occult research, they become Satanists. Citation needed? Patricia Pulling, another mother of a suicide victim who was taught D&D in the classroom, says the game brainwashes children into in violent occultism. Since it is a role-playing game, it's used for behaviour modification. Brainwashing can take place in 72 hours if proper elements and pressures are used, she says. Now, Patricia Pulling. Now, her son committed suicide, um, which is a very sad story. But when you start to look into more details of that, um, especially the stories that she tells... Uh, you can kind of see that warnings were there. Her son um, played Dungeons & Dragons in a school class, but not in class, it was an after-school club. And yes, a teacher was the Dungeon Master. Now, she claims that he was given a curse by the teacher, and that's what caused him to kill himself, because the curse meant he was going to hurt others, and he was a good kid, so he killed himself rather than hurt other people. But her daughter says at a previous point that he threatened her. Also, before he killed himself, he uh, a couple of nights before, or maybe even just the night before, he went out into the garden and killed all the family cats, which is not the signs of a healthy mind. The police came in, searched his room, found Dungeons & Dragons stuff, and asked the mother, uh, Patricia, about the satanic game that he was playing. And that was apparently the first time she heard about it. But later on, she claims that he'd been into it for a long time, and all, claims to have all this other knowledge about it, that he told her that he'd been cursed. But if she, if she didn't know about it until the police told her, how did he tell her about this curse? Her story ha is full of holes. Let's put it that way. Um, now, I can be completely understanding of that. She's a parent who's lost a child. And rather than blame anything, you would rather blame something out of your control. And that's probably where she's coming from. It's this satanic game. The school tried to get him to play it, or the school got him to play it. It's the school's fault. They led him to Satanism and killing himself. He was a good kid. Well, sadly, he looks like a troubled kid. Um, anyway. Sturm has frequently debated pulling on national TV shows as 60 Minutes and Entertainment Tonight. He characterizes D&D as mythology, which he says not is the same as religion or occultism. The allegations of the game being a cult or religious is quite ridiculous, says Sturm. What is in the books is simply ancient history and based on mythology. Dungeon Masters and Deities. However, Legends and Lore, a D&D rulebook, uses distinctly religious terms as it instructs players about the game's gods, goddesses, and demigods. A Dungeon Master player or DM as director of the game determines the actions of the deities and how players must appease them. 
No fantasy world is complete without the gods, mighty deities who influence the fates of the men and move mortals about like chess pieces in their obscure games of power, the book reads. The gods serve an important purpose for players as well. Serving as a deity is a significant part of Dungeons & Dragons and all the player characters should have a patron god. Fair enough. Deities of all types expect a great deal of work from their clerics in return for power to perform miracles. Yet you've got to follow the rules. You don't do evil acts if you're following a good god. A cleric, no matter where he where he or she is, acts as an agent and representative of his or her deity. Clerics should miss no opportunity to explain and show others, both through word and deed, the truth and rightness of his or her religion. Depending on the religion and DM's decision, certain rituals and services must be performed. The cleric should also freely undertake the performance of exceptional duties and voluntary martyrdom. Pullen's 16-year-old son, Irving Bink Lee II, became one of those voluntary martyrs in 1982. On June 9th that year, Susan Peckett, teacher of a class Bink Pulling intended for, high, for talented and gifted students at Patrick Henry High School in Montpellier, VA, allegedly invited Scott Hutchinson, a dungeon master and English teacher in the school, to her class. Hutchinson allegedly led the class in a D&D campaign, during which he delivered a written curse to Bink Pulling. The curse said that Pulling's character's soul belonged to Hutchinson, who were directed to become an evil killer. Before Bink Pulling left school, Patricia Pulling says he cleaned his locker and brought home various D&D books and other occult writings. He dumped these materials on the kitchen table, allowing his parents to see them for the first time. He then went to his room, wrote a suicide note, put a gun to his heart and shot himself. Well, when did he threaten the cats? And when did he threaten the sister? Why were the books in the bedroom and the parents unaware of the game? There's... This story doesn't align with other stories. So I definitely poured out on this. He felt doomed by the curse, his mother said. In his writings to us, he said he thought he was supposed to kill someone else. The curse did not say to kill himself, but since he could not kill my husband, myself, or my daughter, the only way to destroy this evil was to kill himself. A cult paraphernalia found in his room after his death, books, pictures, symbols, indicate his fascination with the dark side of the supernatural. Medieval weapons found under his bed revealed his identification with the fighter magic user character he played in the D&D campaigns. The game tells you to make your own weaponry, said Pat Pulling. He could have killed the whole family in our sleep with these things. Where does the game say that you create your own weaponry? I have never seen that. I've seen some rules where you can go into it and you can craft things, but those are mainly later editions. That wasn't original ad and After her son's death, Patricia Pulling sought out local college students who were regular D&D campaigners and played D&D with them to learn more about the game. With her husband, Irving, she filed a suit against school principal, the two teachers in TSR. All suits were later dismissed. Again, she's trying to find someone to blame and very, very sad for the death of her son, but it looks completely unrelated to me. Um, It's also very odd that if she played it, other places say she played for a month every night with these college students, but she shows constant holes in her knowledge on basics of Dungeons and Dragons, which if somebody was playing it for a long period, I wouldn't expect them to have. The Pullings Incorporated bother about Dungeons and Dragons, bad, almost immediately. The group, which has members and directors nationwide, has become the strongest anti dnd lobby in the country. It seeks to inform the public of violent and cult nature of the game and occult motivation behind some violent crimes. Soon after the organisation of bad, Pat Dempsey, a retired policeman from Seattle, enlisted to serve. He lost his son, Michael, to a dindy related suicide in spring of 1981. There's no doubt in my mind that he came under demo- influence of demonic forces. He wrote an open letter. Dempsey now works as one of the directors of bad from Florida. His son had never evidenced any psychological or emotional problems, nor any interest in the occult. Dempsey wrote that after becoming enmeshed in the game, Michael refused to do his chores. He lost interest in home life and neglected his studies except for a computer program built on D&D. One day, Michael calmly told his mother that he no longer loved her. That was enough for Pat Dempsey. He told his son to stop playing the game and to start coming home immediately from school. Then he wrote, Michael became a different person. Okay, so Michael was playing a video game all the time. We've seen people who are kind of addicted to video games many times in all our lives now. And his parents didn't allow him to interact with friends either. This, to me, looks like things which would lead to a kid losing all hope and suicide looking like a good option to them. Um, Suicide obviously isn't a good option. It's tragic for everybody around you. But 
it's so easy for kids to become hopeless and see it as the only way out, the only big change they can make in their life. And it looks like his parents were restricting it. No, you can't play the games you like. No, you can't see your friends. You must be here. You must do chores. Yada, yada, yada. We're not seeing the full story, but this all seems indicative to me. Um... His voice changed to a deep guttural sound, his face became somewhat twisted, his eyes were glazed as he screamed at me that he was going to finish his D&D program. In the next second, his voice was normal. He quietly told me that he had to work on his D&D program and get a good grade. Those were his last words. He went into his room. Later, my wife and I heard what sounded like a firecracker. We found him lying in the centre of the room, dead of a gunshot wound. The smell of garlic and sulphur was in the air. Garlic and sulphur are used to conjure up demons. So... Somehow, through a Dungeon Dragons rulebook, this kid summoned up a demon, and the demon caused him to kill himself, according to the parent. Again, looking for reasons beyond your own actions, which led to your kid tragically killing himself. I'm really sad for these. I'm a parent myself now, but this really seems to be reaching out for anything apart from what you did. Um, Lakeno was otherwise... Likewise, spurred by a son's suicide to work as director of a bad travel in the country with a video and slide presentation which documents the occult sources used in D&D. She points to more than 50 crimes nationwide, murders, suicides, rapes, attacks and robberies which the game is implicated. Leocono describes her son's two-year involvement in the occult, ending with his death in 1982. We searched his room after the police left. His suicide note was written in a black book with a silver unicorn on it. He called it the Book of Shadows. In the suicide note, he indicated he was going to the abyss of hell to be with his real father, Lucifer. We searched his room and came up with some D&D paraphernalia and much more occult paraphernalia. Little by little, we pieced together with the aid of his friends. Some were reluctant to talk, and some talked three years after the fact. We found out that another boy in the same class had introduced him to Satanism. I believe he used Dungeons and Dragons as a tool to interest my son in this. The thing grew from game planning to full-fledged ceremonies and rituals and belief in the occult. Well, no matter what you use, it's the end thing. So Dungeons and Dragons here, she doesn't seem to be implicating in anything beyond somebody used it for a purpose it wasn't designed for. Attempted Solutions. Seeing the 700 Club interview, Sanchez said that he sees actual black magic beliefs and practices in D&D. He once unsuccessfully urged his former employee to write new game scenarios that would not create historical occultism. His research in 1982 opened his eyes for the first time to the authentic occult origins of the D&D system, Sanchez said. said. Pointing to the pages of several of the D&D volumes, Sanchez related the history of a god called Moloch. He indicated the symbols, the pentagram, the magic circle, and thaumaturgic triangle, which are found in occult writings and D&D instructions. These things have very specific meanings, roots, powers, and the black arts. That's where they come from. They are very important to the game for certain spells and rights, Sanchez said. After offering his report to the TSR board, Sanchez was told by another employee who attended the meeting. The report was immediately thrown in the trash can. Sanchez said that his research group flagged the problem and offered solutions. Simple editing. Let's remove these things. It's a fairly simple manner, matter to come up with our own magic system, designs, rituals, fictitious myths that would mean nothing, that would make the game 100% fantasy. But nothing was done, he said. Instead of admitting a mistake and correcting it, we decided to protect a product that was selling very well. Reprinted from the standard copyright 1987 Regent University, used by permission. So... Uh, going back to Gally Sanchez, who seems to have no problem with the occult itself, seems to be based on it being the real world encroaching on the fantasy world. Why in a world where the elves, dwarves, halflings, trolls, dragons, etc. are there traditional Christian elements? That makes complete sense. You would be wanting to create everything for your fantasy world. It's what Tolkien did, and that's the core of Dungeons and Dragons. Create everything for yourself. You know, the uh, demons in Lord of the Rings aren't Christian demons. They're completely different. And that's what I think Gally Sanchez was suggesting. That they make their game totally fa uh, fantasy. Remove all elements of the real world from it, and make their own world. And that makes a lot of sense and doesn't sound very anti-Dungeon Dragons. 
But, as I've said, I'm putting words in a dead man's mouth. We'll never really know, I think, unless I can find some source where he discussed it later. But on my initial searches, there seems to be none of that around. But he obviously went on to writing about things. He did adventures for Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. He didn't take these things seriously. They weren't a massive threat. He wasn't dealing with it from that point of view. He was dealing with it, I believe, from this is fantasy, let's make it all fantasy. And that is it. Now, if you need a prayer for any need in your life, call... 1-804-420-070. Prayer counsellors are available 24 hours a day to pray with you. CBN, Virginia Beach, Virginia. D&D &D 2, 2007 on the date on here. But it seems to have been first published in 1992. I don't know whether that's just a reference number or whether that is a reprint date. Now, this leads us into all the things about Bothered at about Dungeons and Dragons, Patricia Pulling, and all that stuff, which has its own leaflet, which I'll deal with in a f at a future date. But this really just seems like a reprint of lots of that. Um, I'm afraid that Mr. Richard White doesn't seem to have done too much investigation for himself. He's delved into a couple of episodes of the 700 Club, which the um, Christian Bible Network broadcasts themselves. And he's believed everything that Patricia Pulling, because, let's put it plainly, the three people who are complaining about it in there, who are being referenced, are all directors about, bothered about Dungeons & Dragons. They're all directors of the same company, or same agency, charity, whatever you want to call it. There's no other groups out there which this leaflet references. Anyway, I think I've witted on for way too long, because that's over half an hour already. So thank you very, very much for sticking with me and watching. But most of all, as absolutely always, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.